Can you hear me? Yeah, awesome. I can. Can you guys? All right. Uh, what you, kind of you, music do you listen to? I just want to explore. This is my new Discovery Weekly by Spotify. It's hey, really yeah. good. It's like pigeonholing oh. you very well. All right. Awesome. Well, this is getting queued up. Um, just want to get a feel for the room a little bit. Um, I know kind of the, the size of the companies here, but just out of curiosity, uh, who's been building software, building companies for more than 10 years? Anyone? Okay. Who's been building companies for more than five years? Okay. More than two years? Okay. Less than two years? Okay. <laughs> what were you guys doing? No, I'm just kidding. Um, cool. So if you can't laugh, then this is going to be a really long 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> Because we're going to go through a lot of data, a lot of really fun stuff, in my opinion. But in most people's opinion, it can get a little dry. But it'll be super interesting um, in terms of your business. Uh, but as Chris said, Patrick Campbell, I'm CEO and founder of a company called Price Intelligently. Um, we're also the makers of ProfitWell. Um, I'll get a little bit into like what we actually do as a company. But just on my personal background, um, I studied econometrics and math in school um, or in university, as you guys say in Europe here. Um, little university joke. Yeah, they're not going to get better, the jokes, so don't worry about it. Um, and then I went and worked. I worked for the U.S. Intel community for a little while, um, which gives some interesting stories um, that we can maybe go through, maybe not go through, depending on the context. Uh, I worked at Google for a little while in Boston. Um, and at both places, I was working in um, what's called econ modeling, which is basically taking a bunch of data um, and really trying to find some sort of output with that particular data. Uh, so when working at the NSA, hunting terrorists with data, um, working at Google, hunting money with data, uh, interestingly enough, same type of process uh, to do both, uh, which I don't really know what that means from an implication standpoint. Um, but we started the company about five years ago. Um, we're completely bootstrapped, um, which means we've taken no outside or even inside funding. Um, customers have basically funded the entire company. And we're about 40 people, uh, just under $10 million in, in ARR, essentially. Um, but what I want to really talk about today, and to kind of give you a lot of relevancy, particularly at the stages that you guys are in your particular businesses, is really how growth is changing. Um, and what I mean by this, and we're going to go through a bunch of data to kind of support this thesis and support what's happening with growth, um, is really that we're in a very, very fascinating time within the startup ecosystem, within the software ecosystem, particularly when it comes to how to actually build your business and what works and what doesn't. And in particular, the big kind of concept that we're going to dig into today, and then we're going to kind of support how you can actually overcome what's happening within the market, um, is this idea that we live in a world where acquisition as we know it is completely dead. And what I mean by that is, for those of you who were kind of building software 10 years ago or even five years ago, um, software was a lot harder to build. Um, it wasn't like you had AWS Marketplace. It wasn't like you had you know, any sense of the cloud that was really easily accessible. Um, it was something where you actually had to have more capital and more technological know-how to actually really, really build a company. And what's really fascinating back then is that if you could raise money, if you could get over that particular barrier, you also had the advantage where new markets or new kind of channels within the market were actually being created almost every single quarter. You had a Facebook, you had a medium-sized channel, you had even like a lot of small channels being created constantly. And today, we're noticing that that's actually changed. Software's not only gotten easier and easier to build, but also marketing is becoming harder and harder where you just can't kind of throw something out there and get a bunch of leads in the door. Um, but you don't have to take my word for it. We're going to go through a bunch of data that actually supports this, um, in particular, given the context that we have um, sitting on a bunch of data. And the reason that we have this kind of context is because, as I mentioned, um, I run a company called Price Intelligently. We also have a product called ProfitWell. Um, and each of these particular products serves kind of two different purposes. On the ProfitWell side, it's essentially free subscription financial metrics that plugs right into your billing system. Um, so if you have Stripe, Braintree, Zora, Chargebee, whatever you're using, you can essentially just plug it right into ProfitWell and get free access to your churn, your MRR, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and then we have some paid products that sit on top of it. But on the price intelligently side, which was our original product, um, we have a set of algorithms and a set of software where we help companies like Atlassian, Lyft, Autodesk, a bunch of different folks basically get their pricing right um, through some processes and some methodologies that we're going to talk about later today. Um, and I'm not giving you kind of context here to, to sell you. I'm really giving you this context because at this point in time, particularly with the data that you're about to see, we've actually seen inside more SaaS companies from a financial perspective 
than anyone else out there. Um, about 20% of the SaaS market is actually using ProfitWell, um, and we've worked with a couple hundred folks on the price intelligently side. Um, and to give you some interesting stats, um, the world of SaaS actually isn't that enormous. Um, it's one of those things where you actually have less than about 50,000 companies out there. Um, so I'm kind of like being a little more humble about 20% of the SaaS market using our product, mainly because it's not like there's millions of companies out there that we're accessing there. Um, but what I want to do is basically dig a little bit deep on some of the data that we're seeing. Um, and in the second half of the presentation, actually give you a framework um, to taking advantage of what's happening in the market, and particularly getting your pricing right, given the context that we have from working with a bunch of companies. How's that sound? Sound like a good time? The Polish people, you guys are very stoic. So I'm just making sure I know like, if we're all on the same page or not here, all right? All right, let's do this. Um, so the first thing that we're noticing within the market, um, and this is particularly in the, what's happening in the SaaS ecosystem, is that you have a point of saturation happening, um, as well as unit economics, basically willingness to pay the CAC that you were able to get previously, just isn't what it used to be. So we were telling that little story of what was happening in software 10 years ago and, and how that's massively shifted. Well, the data actually supports that massive shift that's happening. So when we look at, for instance, just the competitive marketplace, when we look at how many competitors that you have, both direct and indirect, at the point of kind of conception of your particular company, what we're noticing is that number is increasing substantially. So we asked a couple of companies, about 1,600 founders out there, we actually asked them, in your first year of business, how many competitors did you actually have? So how many people did you consider kind of fighting for the same particular customers? And what we found is that those companies that were about five years old, they had just under three competitors when they first started. And those companies that started basically in the past year here had just under 10. Now what's fascinating about this is that when we asked a follow-up question, we actually said, hey, like that was when you started, how many competitors do you have now? What we actually found is that everyone's fighting about double digits. And it was actually 1,400 folks, not 1,600 folks. And what that really means is that those companies that were just a year old, who had, I think it was like 9.7 on the previous slide, they're actually looking at about 10.25. And then those folks who had only three folks five years ago, they're looking at double digit competitors as well. And you folks have probably seen this as well with your companies, depending on what you're starting. If you're not working on something that's just super revolutionary, like fucking Elon Musk or rocket ships or things like that, um, you're probably seeing this as well because again, software is quote unquote easy to start now. You can spin up a server, you can spin up whatever you need to do, and if all 100 of us wanted to start a new company by the end of the day, we actually could do that with things like lead pages, um, different email marketing products, just the accessibility of tech repos and things like that, and all of a sudden we could be off to the races. Now most of those products wouldn't be great, um, just admittedly, because we started them in basically 12 hours, but the fact remains is that there's a lot of noise out there. And what's interesting is what's happening is we all used to say like competition doesn't matter, right? Like that was something that a lot of people used to give advice around. The issue though is that all of this competition, not only for actual different customers, but also for the feature sets that are out there on our products, especially in a B2B environment, means that the relative value of features is actually declining. So to give you an anecdote, it used to be even five years ago, you could sell a Salesforce integration within your product for a thousand bucks a month. It was just something that people wanted so much because everyone was using Salesforce, but they wanted to make sure their data or whatever you were doing, made sure that data was integrated with Salesforce. But today, that same Salesforce integration is actually worth basically nothing. It's something that's just expected. And the reason is because that was the last moat between you and different competitors. And we've actually seen this across about 500,000 willingness to pay data points. Um, we actually measured willingness to pay um, using a little bit of a variation of a methodology we're going to talk about in a bit, where we actually looked at the value of different features like integrations, analytics, and even core product features four years ago compared to today. And you can actually see for some of these features, you're losing about 70% of that actual value. And the reason is, this should be pretty intuitive, is that if you're building something like a CRM, if you're building something that, again, isn't a rocket ship, it's not like it's unique anymore. It's not something that isn't just expected by your particular consumer. Now, if you have a really, really good product team, and I know in Europe, particularly Eastern and Northern Europe, you guys are really, really good at your engineering and really, really good at product, this might not necessarily be a huge problem, right? Because you can just build really, really good stuff. The issue, though, is 
is that CAC, or customer acquisition cost, is also increasing over time. So remember what we talked about, those channels that are, were being created almost every single quarter back in, let's say, SaaS 1.0? Those channels aren't really kind of popping up as frequently anymore, which means you have to be more efficient, you have to be better with acquisition, you have to know how to grow and how to apply growth tactics because of all of this competition happening with acquisition, CAC has actually increased both for B2B and B2C by nearly 50%. So what's happening, and this is particularly prescient for, I think, folks in Poland, or at least what I've heard about Polish startups, is that a lot of you guys don't like to sell or market yourselves, right? You know, it's not something that you're like, oh, I don't know, we, that seems too salesy, it seems too pitchy, right? Well, the issue is it's gotten even harder. It's gotten even harder because you don't want to do it, and now it's more expensive, right? And you're feeling it from both sides. One, people don't want to pay any more for software as much as they were paying. And also, they're really, really hard to acquire because everyone's got ebooks, everyone's got PPC ads, everyone's got sales teams. And it's painful of what's happening in the market. Now, what's interesting, and this kind of alludes to what I was talking about with kind of Polish folks and sales and marketing, is that this is all of our fault what's happening, and our, our pain that's happening with these particular market dynamics is all of our fault. And when I say our, I mean SaaS operators, us that are building businesses. And the reason is because we make matters worse by focusing on the wrong fundamentals. So we asked those 1,400 founders from not only Fortune 500 companies, but all the way down to SaaS, Johnny and Jane startups. We actually asked them if they had to pick a pillar of growth within their business, acquisition, monetization, or retention, what would be the one thing that they wanted to focus on? And what we anticipated was a pretty even split, meaning 33% of folks would care about acquisition, monetization, and then retention, respectively, mainly because they're at different stages within their business. But these folks, both funded and non-funded and all across the size spectrum, they all cared about more logos. I just want more acquisition. I just want more logos out there. I don't care how much money we're making per customer. I don't really care how long we're keeping those customers around. Just give me more logos. Now, this isn't necessarily a huge problem in and of itself, but those market dynamics, what they're creating, are serious problems for companies that just focus on this. Because there's clear winners and losers on these companies, and particularly in their growth strategies. So we looked at about 90 companies that died in the past few years. Um, and this is qualitative data on the next slide. It's a graph, and whenever you have a graph and qualitative data, I feel like it's important to qualify that, if you will. Um, but we looked at these 90 companies, and we separated them into two groups. Those folks were primarily acquisition-focused, meaning the only numbers in their business that were improving were their net new leads or their conversion rate. And we compared them to a group where not only the acquisition numbers were getting better, but also their monetization numbers, their ARPA, as well as their retention numbers, their net retention or their churn were also getting better. Not all at the same rate, but all three were getting better at the same time. And what we found is that those folks were primarily acquisition focused, this darker color here, they were dying at an alarmingly higher rate than those folks who had this balanced growth. And when we looked a little bit deeper, we looked at companies that were still alive, meaning they were still growing, they were still going out there, and we compared these two particular groups, what we found is that quantitatively, those folks who have this balanced growth are growing at almost twice the rate as those companies that are primarily acquisition focused. And what's fascinating about this as well is that year over year, that power of acquisition at least on a macro level, is essentially diminishing. And what's interesting is when we went even deeper on this particular concept and we started looking at the microeconomic impact, so we compared a bunch of different firms and we were actually looking at what is the relative impact of each of these levers within their business, what we found is that a 1% increase in acquisition, so a 1% increase in net new leads or conversion rate, just some sort of 1% improvement in acquisition, equated to about a 3% boost in your bottom line, which is not bad. You know, we'll take that all day, every day, if we can get it at a pretty efficient ROI. But a 1% improvement in retention equated to just under a 7% boost in your bottom line, and then a 1% improvement in monetization, just under a 13% boost in your bottom line. And what's really painful about this is, again, if we look at a time lapse, 
And this is 2008 to 2012, the darker color, and then 2013 to 2016, this lighter color. You're actually seeing that this acquisition impact reduced about 30% in both monetization and retention both gained pretty substantial numbers from a relative basis. But remember, this is what we care about as companies, and this is what works. This is what we care about, and that's what works. I could do this all day. This is my, this is my favorite part right here. But it's painful, right? It's painful, especially at, at a lot of your stages particularly because you're just trying to build a product right now. You're just trying to get out there. Or maybe some of you have some traction, but a lot of you that have some traction, you're trying to grow. And obviously, you need to acquire more customers. But oftentimes what happens, especially for your companies that are, you know, have been around for longer than a year, is that this is where we only think growth can actually come from. When in reality, the real power is in your monetization and retention. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, if you know what you're doing, this is huge. Like, if you know how to set up your growth framework, if you know how to push things forward, you obviously need to have some sort of acquisition. But it can't be at the loss of any focus on monetization or retention. So when we looked into actually you know, examining this problem, we wanted to understand the cause of it as well. And we talked a little bit about, you know, hey, we don't know our buyers, or we don't know, you know we're so focused on acquisition. But the simple fact is what we found when we started digging deeper and actually talking to more and more founders and kind of operators at larger companies is that most of these folks don't have any representation of what's known as a buyer persona. Um, so who knows what a buyer persona is? Cool. Who has buyer personas in their business? We lost way too many people. Uh, so of those who have buyer personas, who has uh, willingness to pay information about their buyers? Anyone? That's where we lose everyone typically. Okay, so when we talk about buyer personas, we're not talking about these like fluffy things that you know HubSpot or Marketo or you know some of these companies have been talking about for a decade. We're talking about actual quantified buyer personas, and what we mean by that is you have your unit economics kind of broken out by buyer. You have your willingness to pay, which we'll talk about how you can measure that in a bit, and then even things like most and least valued features for your particular product. And this is super important to actually collect from your customer for a lot of reasons. Um, but one of the bigger reasons that a lot of times people ask about is that your usage does not correlate to value. Um, it sometimes does, but what we found hand in hand when we look at different software products is that you know, something like analytics is not really a most used feature, even in kind of an enterprise product, but it is something that's super, super valuable. Um, or even accounting products, we consistently see you know, invoices as the most used feature just because it's something that's really, really important but it's typically one of the least valued just because it's expected. It's something that isn't necessarily a, a big buying point for a particular customer. But what's fascinating about this is what we found is that the reason a lot of people don't have these or even some semblance of these is that most of us aren't actually talking to our customers. So we talked to about, this is where we have about 1,650 founders, and we asked, how many times are you talking to a customer or a target customer in a non-sales capacity per month? And most of us, we're talking to 10 or less people in a customer development capacity. Do we all know what customer development is? Who knows what customer development is? OK. So customer development for the rest of us, it's, it's basically um, it's a driving factor of doing research to understand your particular customer. So if you read Paul Graham, if you read any of like, the big luminaries in Silicon Valley, and any article that's like, the one thing that made us successful, like any of those types of articles, it typically comes back to customer development. And just to give you some context, I know a lot of you guys are kind of startups or early stage. There are Fortune 500 companies in this particular match, um, which is scary because, again, they were able to basically get by by not necessarily needing to talk to their customers, not needing to understand them, because they didn't have that many competitors. They didn't have these market dynamics that you're facing. And we get a lot of people who then go, like, well, I don't need to talk to my customers. Like, that's bullshit. Like, we'll do a bunch of experiments. We'll talk to a bunch of people. We won't talk to people. We'll just do a bunch of A-B testing. Nope. Most of us are doing zero tests per month. We love to retweet the articles. We love to share them on Facebook. We love to talk about them. We love to give the advice about testing. But most of us aren't doing it. And what's kind of fascinating is that the reason that this should be so scary 
particularly when it comes to your pricing or really just kind of growing your business, is because everything that you do in your business, from your sales and your marketing all the way down to your product and your finance team, is used to justify the particular price that you're offering or driving someone to a particular purchasing decision. So if you have no idea who the hell these people are, there's no way in hell you're gonna know what your pricing should look like, and oftentimes there's no way in hell you're gonna know how to efficiently grow your particular business. Does that make sense? It's a pretty big point. This was my crescendo to here, okay? All right, so the big thing I want you to take away from that section, besides maybe some data points and some things like that, um, is really this concept that a lot of us, what we end up doing, and it's very easy to do this when you're an engineer or you're a product-focused business, is we don't talk to our customers, we just build things, right? Like something isn't working, it must be a feature. Something isn't working, we must build something. But oftentimes what ends up happening is you build, you build, you build, and then 18 months goes by and all of a sudden you forgot what you were actually doing and you just wasted 18 months when really talking to your customer for a month would have saved you maybe 12 of those 18 months to actually get to what you should be building or where the value actually is within your product. Okay? So we all feel pretty bad. We all feel pretty pissed off. We all feel very disappointed in Patrick. That's okay, I'm going back to Boston tonight, so I won't see you ever again. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so how do we fix this, all right? I wasn't gonna leave you hanging. Um, how do we actually fix this in our businesses? So I, I can't teach pricing or customer development in you know even 45 whole minutes, let alone the, the half the time I have right now. Um, but what I wanna do is I wanna give you a framework. Um, and we'll make sure the slides and the materials get out to everyone. Everything that you're gonna see, you don't need to buy anything to do. Um, maybe a survey tool if you want to make it a little bit easier on yourself, um, but you can also use Google Forms or something like that if you really, really want to be cheap. Um, pay the 50 bucks, just get a survey tool, but I'm not going to judge your business. Well, I'll judge your business, I'm not going to tell you what to do though. Okay, um, anyways, so how do we actually fix this? Um, so we're going to walk through a brief example, um, and it's actually super personal to us. So when I was kind of explaining the company history, um, I didn't really give you the, the whole timeline. So we launched Price Intelligently about five years ago, um, and that's a, that's a bigger product. It's one of those things where it's not, a, um, it's, it's not a touchless sale. It's something where we actually work with the team, our software implementation is a little bit more enterprise heavy, um, and we actually were sitting with a company that was about to IPO um, about three years ago. So if you really want to figure it out, you could go figure out who it was. Um, but they were about to IPO, and we were helping them with their pricing with our software, um, and we actually discovered with this particular company that they were calculating their monthly recurring revenue incorrectly, um, their MRR, for those of you who, who know the moniker. Um, and for those of you who know and do your metrics within your business, that's kind of like logging into your bank account and reading the number wrong. Like, you gotta get that number right, and a CFO who had taken two other companies public, and this was his third, getting that number wrong, like, that was like an oh shit moment for us. That was like, oh my God, we can build something to solve this problem. Um, and what we started building was actually ProfitWell. Um, and so it did not look like this. It looked very bad. Um, it was one of those things where obviously it was an MVP. But we were super excited. We were like, this is the product we're going to build. This is going to make us millionaires, billionaires. This is going to be amazing because this company got this wrong and, and we can help all the SaaS companies that exist. Um, so we built, uh, you know, a little product, and we tried to make 10 companies super, super happy. So we had some big companies in there, we had some small companies. We wanted to make these 10 companies super excited about the product, and then we were going to quote-unquote launch. Um, but when we went to launch, what we found um, is that we were not the only brilliant people in this particular space. Um, and everyone was like, oh, you know, this other company, Chart Mogul, just launched this month too. And this other company, Bear Metrics, they launched a couple weeks ago as well. Um, and literally overnight, we had 36 different competitors. Um, it wasn't overnight, but um, it was one of those things where, like, I, I kid you not, I can show you the timestamps. Like, Bear Metrics, Chart Mogul, and us literally launched in the same month, um, which was just mind boggling because we don't know any of those people, or we didn't. Um, Domo and Insight Squared, these are more indirect competitors of ours. But then because development on Stripe in particular was quote unquote easy, it was one of those things where you know, all these companies started popping up. They weren't all good, but it was one of those things where they just kind of popped up. 
Um, and we were pretty upset. We were like, oh, man. Like, we had this brilliant idea, right? You know, this brilliant idea that was going to make us millionaires. And so we decided, you know, what do we need to do? Um, and so we had a pretty product-oriented team at the time. Um, one that, you know, hey, we could build this, and that'll differentiate us. We could build that. Um, but fortunately, we had kind of the three years of experience working at Price Intelligently um, to know that we should just stop building. We should start talking. So what we did is we stopped product development, um, we, except for a few bug fixes here and there. Um, and for the love of God, talk to your customers. I swear to God, I will come back to Warsaw and kick the shit out of No, I'm just kidding. Um, so w what I mean by this is, even if you don't have a framework, and we're going to teach a framework, I can send you some blog posts and other people who have studied this and know a lot more about customer development than I do in particular. But you got to put a number on your whiteboard, your chalkboard, whatever you're using, of like, these are the number of people we're going to talk to in a non-sales capacity. Start at five, start at three, start at 10, depending on the size of your business. But just make sure that you're talking to these folks in particular, um, because they're the only ones who are going to tell you direction, as you'll see through this, this little case study. Um, so this is a way that, that we did it originally. Um, this is the way we recommend doing it because it's super quantified and it's, it's something where you can get um, some really, really good strong data very, very quickly. So the pricing process or kind of our customer development process, um, it has three big parts. The first is the experimental design and the data that you're pulling from. Um, and this looks super fancy, but really what this is is like who are you asking and what are you asking the questions of? Using some basic statistical analysis, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, I do have a background in econometrics, but everything can be done in Excel. It's, it's fairly simple math, I promise. And then finally, taking that data, analyzing it down, and, and making some decisions. So for us in particular, we started out with two personas. And this is the first step that I recommend that you should do in your businesses right now, because you're not starting from zero. You have some context in who you're selling to. You wouldn't be in the space if you didn't. So what I would do is I would take, it doesn't have to look like this, but maybe you take a spreadsheet and on the columns on the top of your page, just put in a couple categories of people you sell to. And then along the rows, put a couple of these categories of what are the most valued features, the least valued features, what is the lifetime value, or what do we estimate the lifetime value as, willingness to pay, same thing, customer acquisition costs, the same thing. And even just doing this, you're going to start to settle a lot of arguments within your business. Because all of a sudden, when you're arguing with your founder, other co-founder, you're arguing with your product manager, you're arguing with a marketer or a salesperson, it's like, hey, we're not building for Startup Steve. We're building for Mary or whomever this person is. And then all of a sudden, it's something that you can start to crystallize those conversations because you can start to group your decisions into these particular personas. Now, to take this to a next step, we really want to make sure that this is kind of quantified. And to do that, there's three types of data we're really looking at. Um, the first is demographic data, and I presume most of you are B2B, so it's not going to be like gender and things like that, although that can help. Uh, but you're really looking at company size, size of their team, it might be the verticals they serve, could be a whole host of things. And kind of the way I like to think about this is anything that you think would separate willingness to pay. So obviously revenue size, like a very, very large company, would probably be willing to pay more than a very, very small company. But any of those different axes from a demographic standpoint that you think would shift it, those are the demographics that you should collect. The other is this relative preference data. That's basically figuring out if I have five things, what's the most or the least important thing out of those five things? And then ironically, the easiest data to collect is willingness to pay data. And so looking at this a little bit further, the two tools you're going to use um, for those two analyses they're not really specially named. They're basically what I just said. Relative preference analysis. It's known as a max diff for any of my stat homies out in the audience. And then price sensitivity, that's where you're really getting that price elasticity. And so to measure what people value, most people, what they end up doing, and, and we've seen these like really shitty surveys, where someone will send us a survey, and the first thing they'll ask is, what's your email address, which is always infuriating, because um, they just sent us an email. That, you guys get it? No? OK. That annoys me a lot. Um, but a lot of times what ends up happening with like kind of a value survey is that people will send you five options and they'll ask you, hey, please rank each of these on a scale of one to 10, right? And why do we think that that's a problem? Audience participation. Why do we think that's a problem? You're pre-selecting, that's true. What else? What do you think the results will look like? Sorry? 
everything's 10, right? Um, and so what we want to do is we want to shift it to actually forcing people to make decisions. Um, so when you study survey design, we study things like conjoint analysis, it really comes down to you want to give them these options, and you want to force them to choose one most important and one least important. And it could be one most preferred, one least preferred. You can change up the most and least jargon a little bit to kind of fit what you're trying to get at. But the reason for this is because when you look at your results, here's what you get with a lot of those one to 10 surveys. And I can't really tell what's most important, what's least important in this particular context. Here's what you get with a max diff survey. And the math is super simple. I promise you it's super simple. It's one of those things where this is one of the most powerful tools you can use in your business. Because when you start arguing about anything to do with features, value propositions, brand, those types of things, just say, hey, let's go get 20 to 30 responses. 20 to 30, it's not really that quantitative. It's a little more qualitative based on most companies that you go after. But you get 100 responses, and you can start making decisions off that particular data, or at least more than directional decisions. And so for us, what we ended up doing, as you kind of saw on this slide, um, is we wanted to really get at what was so important about ProfitWell. And so in this particular case, what we ended up doing is we collected this data, and we found out that accuracy and insights were super, super important to people. And then we broke this down, and I think this is going to, yep, there we go. We broke this down essentially by size when it came to MRR, and our mid-market person really isn't a mid-market person. It was right around six million at the time, which is a little bit of a, something we can talk about later. But really, it came down to accuracy, and they didn't really care about some of the other things. And this data isn't, I don't think this is the actual data now that I'm looking at it, but when we started to look at this on a persona by persona basis, we started to figure out what the difference is between these two, per two particular personas look like. And so what we found is that Startup Steve, and this is the right information, really cared about price, and really cared about design. Why do you think that sucks? Anyone? We don't make any money, right? And it's an MVP, it's design. It's, it's so ironic that the people don't want to pay anything. They really care about good design, right? That never goes together. Um, and then what was really fascinating is our mid-market customer, they really cared about depth, they really cared about accuracy. So that was super telling. And if we didn't do anything else, let's say we didn't collect any more data and we just stopped right here, this would set our product direction. We need to be the most accurate and we need to have depth. We don't need to care necessarily about price or design. But we did go a step further, and we actually looked at willingness to pay. And I'm really glad we did, as you'll see in a second, because what ends up happening with a lot of our companies, um, and this particularly happens in Europe, it's not just Eastern Europe, um, we either overprice or we underprice, and it's never by a little bit. Um, it's never by like $5 or 5 euros. It's always by like 30%, what we typically find. Um, and I don't know if it's, it's probably a deep psychological thing where like Europeans, you guys just don't know the value of your products. The US folks, we're too arrogant. We think our products are worth a hell of a lot more than they actually are. Um, but you can do really basic analysis to figure out where that value is. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna quite simply go ask your customers or your target customers four basic questions. And you can adjust these slightly depending on what you're asking in particular. But we're going to ask in ranges. At what price point is this way too expensive that you would never consider purchasing it? All the way down to, and this is sometimes the most important, at what point is it too cheap that you question the quality of it? Because if you come at me and you say you're going to solve world, solve world peace and you're going to do it for five bucks a month, I'm not going to believe you. You're going to think you're a scam, right? And the reason that this methodology works so well is because human beings, we think about value on a spectrum. We don't think about value as like a single point. Like we don't inherently know that this computer is worth 1,000 euros. What we do know is that this computer is worth a hell of a lot more than this water bottle, and that both of these things are worth less than this entire building. Now, it's kind of a dramatic point, but um, just to give you a couple of examples, um, one of my favorite examples about value is, um, does anyone here play poker? Has anyone here not played poker before? Okay, cool. Um, so there's this poker player in the States, and this was maybe 10 years ago, and he um, was old school, he's an older guy. He only, he never owned a computer. He only played like actual in-person poker. Um, but all of his younger friends who were poker players, they started making like substantial amounts of money on, on computer poker, like online poker. Um, so he wanted to get in on the game. 
he went to Best Buy, which is like an electronics store, to buy a computer, and he went with $50,000 because he thought, because they were making so much money, that a computer must be worth $50,000, right? Another dramatic example, but it starts to prove the point. Psychologists and economists have studied this, this for years. This value factor is very, very range. It's very, very spectrum within us. And when you start to take this data and you start to translate it, um, and this math is relatively simple, we use Excel to do most of this, you can basically see that each of these questions correlates to one of these lines. So what point is this way too expensive, getting expensive, a good deal, and too cheap that you question the quality of it? And you get this nice little diamond here, right? So even if we just collected 50 responses from target customers or our current customers or our current prospects, we start to have directional data around, we should be around here, right? We thought we were up here, we're really down here, we thought we were down there. And then if you get enough data, you can get what's called the elasticity curve. And the elasticity curve is just a jargony way of saying, if I move the price, how much loss or gain in revenue or number of customers am I going to get? And so here, there are certain situations where you might be down here with your price, and all of a sudden, if you go up here, yeah, you're going to lose customers, but you're not necessarily going to lose them at an ROI deficient rate. In other cases, and we've seen this with some European companies, you might be down here. You raise your price, you not only raise ARPA, but you also raise your conversion rate because people start trusting that you're actually fulfilling what you're trying to do with your pro particular product. And when you start to bring this together, you can actually break this down by your different personas or by these different segments. So here you might find, here's the willingness to pay across these different spectrums. And then even here, here's the willingness to pay across different roles as well. And this starts to become super, super powerful because all of a sudden you start cross-referencing what's actually going on with your different buyers. And you might discover the only person you can sell to is this particular person, but they also have the least willingness to pay. And that starts to help you make decisions around, is this an ROI efficient business that I should be targeting, or should I build something else, or should I try to find something that will help a different persona who's willing to pay more? So what we found and this is our actual data from a few years ago now. When we looked at people's willingness to pay for metrics, this is what we discovered. And who knows why we were depressed when we saw this data? Anyone? Take a guess. It's not, it's, it, it's fairly obvious when I say it, you're gonna be like, oh, that was nothing. But like, why is this interesting? Sorry? Uh, nope, nope. We didn't have a price at this point. So the reason, and maybe this wasn't as, as obvious, I know it's a hard graph, you haven't seen these before. Our sl smallest customer is willing to pay about 50 bucks a month. It's interesting, like for an entry point, it's not bad. Our largest customer at the time was really only willing to pay 250 bucks a month. So the reason that this is awful and you should really be relevant or you know, thinking about the relevancy of this in your business is because if your smallest customer and your largest customer are only separated by 5x, you don't have a lot of opportunity for expansion revenue. So if we look at this as being like a metrics, and let's just imagine that we were charging someone based on their size, people don't necessarily grow from this small side to this large size in that, you know, that short amount of time. Sometimes it takes a long time for them to get there. And if you also remember what we talked about, at a maximum capacity, there's only 50,000 subscription companies out there in the world right now. So we're trying to build a business, theoretically, selling analytics, where you have this expansion revenue problem, and there just aren't a lot of people out there, right? And it got kind of worse when we started to do our analysis here and we looked at just basic lifetime value. We did a very back of the envelope kind of calculation of like what we could expect for lifetime value. And then also for our customer acquisition cost, how much it was actually gonna cost to acquire these customers at scale. And what stinks about this? Yeah, you're losing money. So like we make 50 bucks on one of these guys and we are basically underwater by half. Now you laugh, but what's amazing is that some of your businesses right now are in this exact position because you're not calculating your metrics, 
you don't know your buyers, and you're just kind of throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall and hoping it sticks. And then what ends up happening is if you can raise that next round, if you can get to a certain size, you all of a sudden will discover, oh no, we've been targeting the wrong person the entire time. And then what's scary about that is that you're 100 people, 50 people, 3,000 people, and you have to change the entire DNA of the business to focus on a new customer. And we've seen this. There's a company that we helped. Um, it was a platform, so you made money on the platform. And they raised about $150 million. Um, they grew you know, revenue to, I think it was like 70 million or something like that at the point that we were talking to them and helping them. And what they discovered is that the customer that they cared so much about was making a million dollars a year on their platform, which is awesome, but it was costing them, not the CAC, but the actual physical cost, 1,200 bucks a month, which also isn't bad because, oh, they're making a million dollars. They were charging them 30 bucks a month. And they didn't realize this for six years. Six years! Now that made us look really good because we could solve the problem for them. But it was one of those things where it was just like they had to have hard conversations and change a pretty big company around to starting to focus more on the mid market and upper market and not chasing kind of the SMB world. And so we were pretty upset about this because we really, really liked the space. But it was one of those things where we were just kind of like, we can't make money here. And what's kind of fascinating is one of our competitors actually gives their metric, or they're, they're, they're pretty transparent with their revenue, like completely transparent. And what you'll find is if you go to their site, is that this is essentially true. And they don't have their CAC up there, but their churn, just based on what we've seen, is essentially true too. And so we knew this essentially three months into development, and we knew that this wasn't going to work. And so we didn't waste any time, and we started actually looking at what some other options were. And so we looked at a churn retention product. Um, so delinquent credit cards. So fun fact, you're going to learn this eventually. Um, about 20 to 40% of your churn is actually from delinquencies. So expirations, people have the wrong card number, all types of stuff. Um, it's actually a huge problem that like, nobody knows about. And so we were like, all right, well, if we solve that problem for you, how much money are you willing to give us? And what we found is that those folks who weren't willing to pay us 50 bucks a month for metrics, they're willing to pay us 150 bucks a month if we solve that problem. And then up here, we had these nice four-figure MRR folks where they're willing to pay us like good substantial revenue if we actually solve that problem. So we had that nice you know, 10 to 20x lift there. And we also asked about something called revenue recognition, which I think most of you are still not in that stage quite yet. Um, but that's something once you reach kind of a million ARR, starts to become like a thing. So you can kind of see that below this mark, people really weren't willing to pay much. Then as you grew, people were willing to pay a lot. And so it was fascinating about us when we started putting this together. Um, what we kind of determined is we had a couple of options. And this is a little more relevant to you. But what we ended up doing is we looked at, and it didn't look as pretty as this, but it was just kind of like, we have these personas. We have this data. What's our pricing look like? And for us in particular, it was a decision where we were either going to scrap the actual ProfitWell product, the, the analytics product, and not develop it, or the other option was give it away for free. Um, and the reason that we started giving it away for free was because we looked at the space, we looked at the competition that was in the space, um, and it became a CAC game, where we were basically trying to figure out how can we diminish CAC as much as possible? And then once someone gets onto the platform, how can we upsell them those other particular products? Well, it's a hell of a lot easier when we have access to their metrics and we can say, like, hey, like, you have this problem. Do you see this problem? We can solve that with a push of one button. And then all of a sudden, you know, we can prove to you we're using it because we have your metrics. We prove to you that we're actually doing well. And so that's the model that we took. And so far, um, I would say we're, we're not early anymore. We're kind of mid-stage. But so far, it's been working out really, really well. Um, and all was because we took the time to basically start small, like the extent of what you just saw, it took us, actually, I think I have it in here. It took us 12 hours total, and then it cost us about $2,100. Um, and that cost came from, we got what are called market panelists. So some of you might be saying, like, oh, I don't have enough customers, I don't have enough prospects to actually do surveys. That's OK. Um, there are companies out there where their entire purpose is to get you access to anything from you know, a stay-at-home mom or dad in the middle of the United States all the way to a Fortune 500 CIO. One costs very different than the other, um, but you can actually get that access and they'll take a 15-minute survey um, in order to get you this type of data. 
And so we didn't have, we had enough people, but they were kind of knew us too well, so we were worried they were gonna give us bad, well, really good responses, but you know, kind of out of context responses. And so we went out and we collected, I think it was about 300 people um, to basically answer those questions that we essentially went through, in addition to some extra kind of segmentation or demographic questions. So the idea here is this doesn't have to take a long time. We do this for a living, so 12 hours, it might take you a little bit longer. But it's one of those things where this saved us, we estimated about 18 months of time based on where our competitors were, based on what we could have looked at, and based on you know, a semi-intelligent you know, kind of conversion of what this time would have meant to us if we didn't have these particular answers of who our customer was and who we were targeting. So the biggest thing, and I kind of mentioned it halfway through here, just get some sort of a process. Um, it doesn't have to be super complicated. You don't have to start with all the things that we're talking about, but it's super important that you know your numbers, and it's super important that you know those particular buyers, mainly because they are the ones who are actually purchasing your product, and they're gonna make everything in your business efficient. So you're gonna be able to take advantage of monetization, retention, and you're gonna be able to take advantage of even acquisition at a really, really good clip, rather than just throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall and like trying to figure out where your market is over years of hoping that you stay in business. So this is my email address. Um, we wrote a book on all of this stuff. Um, or Yeah, I wrote a book. It was very bad um, and just so much work. It's not a bad book. It's actually, we're really excited about it. Um, I basically took the five years of experience we have, um, a lot of the framework we talked about, and we distilled it down. It's free. Um, you can get our website. If you don't want to fill a form out, you can just email me. That's totally fine. Um, but yeah, it's something that we're more than happy to help with. Um, I think it's one of those things where, you know, just having some sort of a framework and just taking this stuff seriously is quite literally the first step that you can do um, to be more successful in your business. And I think we have a couple minutes. Let's do it this way that Martin will, I'll introduce Martin. Uh, he's oh, we'll uh, a panel. partner. Yeah, we'll switch into the panel so we ha can have questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, wow, a lot of really interesting yeah. Uh, I'm great at parties, guys. It's <laughs> like all I do right now. And no. so much data there. Like I'm I amazed know. by that. So, so thank you very much for, for the talk. Absolutely. Uh,